Well, a very warm welcome to you this morning here at Naunton Lane on Sunday the 16th of May. It's lovely to see you all this morning. If you're first time here with us or first time watching us on YouTube, a special warm welcome to you. Everything you need for the service is underneath the screen on, your, on the YouTube channel. Just a few notices before we get started this morning. This afternoon we have our, our youth Bible class, that's at four o'clock on Zoom. And then Lord willing, tonight at six o'clock we'll have our evening service. Where we're beginning a new series through the book of Ezra. So at six o'clock on Zoom, on Zoom tonight and also on YouTube. If you haven't got the, the Zoom link for that and you'd like it, then let me know and I can email that to you. And Lord willing, next Sunday... The 23rd of May, we'll be here again in the building, and on Zoom in the evening, I'll be leading in the morning and the evening. Coming up this week, on Wednesday lunchtime, we have our Mum's Bible Study, that's at half past one on Zoom, and our midweek Bible Study and prayer meeting is at 7.45 on Zoom as well. Thursday is our Men's Fellowship. Uh, we're going through uh, chapter nine of our book, Discovering God. Again, if you're a man and you fall into that category and you haven't come before but you'd like to then I can get you a copy of the book and you're very welcome to join us this Thursday 7:45 on zoom I'll send out a link for that early this week Friday is our jam club which is our our children's club for a primary age children it's at four o'clock on zoom and our youth group is at seven o'clock which Michael and Laura Cochran run so our notices for today. Let's hear our call to worship from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray together as we begin. Almighty and heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we can gather together on this first day of the week, this day that we remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the blessings that are bestowed upon us through his, his death and his resurrection. We thank you that we come to worship the ascended Lord who is seated on high. Please bless us. Do us good this morning and this day we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to our first hymn together. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice.
Let us continue in worship as we pray together. Almighty and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can know your power, your creativity, your glory through the wonder and the beauty of your creation, through the biodiversity, through the stars, through the mountains, the seas, all your creation sings your praises. We thank you and praise you that we can know of your grace and of your glory through your revealed word, your word written that we have in in the Bible, but also the word that became flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God who became man to save us, to show us undeserved grace, to show us love and mercy to those who do not deserve it, to us who are judgment-deserving sinners, we receive all that we do not deserve in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing is found in him and given freely to those who would come to you by faith. Father, forgive us of our blindness, our blindness to our sin and our need of a saviour. Forgive us of our not trusting you, not looking to Jesus, but trusting in all other things for our security and our hope when all other things fall down and fall short of your glory. Please help us as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, as we find revealed in your word, to come to him, to bow before him, to trust him and to serve him, our Lord and our Saviour as he gave his life for us, let us give our lives for him. We pray these things, and we ask that we might do these things through your help, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come to our, the baptism part of the service this morning, baptism of Isaac. He was a, asleep. Oh, there he is. He's uh, sat up awake now. He's ready Otherwise, the water would be quite an abrupt awakening. Let me just say a few things about what we're going to be doing here when we come to baptise Isaac. Jesus said in Matthew 28, says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, at that point, before his ascension, is giving all authority. He is the head of the church, and he institutes, at that moment, the ordinance of baptism. It's by his command. See, baptism is also in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's an act of God claiming this one for himself, putting his name on that one. It's a covenant sign as well, a covenant relationship, which is a relationship between two parties. Throughout the Bible, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. But it's not a relationship between two equals. God is the superior, the creator. We are his creatures. And so baptizing is, yes, a nice thing to do, but it's not just that. It's a thing to do because God commands it. It's a sign of covenant initiation. I will be your God. Trust me. Love me. Serve me. Depend on me. Not a sign of our faith, but of God's condescending love and grace. And in God's grace, he incorporates the children of believers, the whole household into his covenant family. This has been the case since Abraham, but circumcising Isaac, circumcising Ishmael, to Acts 2, where Peter was preaching and said, the promise is not just for you, but also for your children. And there's countless times of household baptisms throughout the New Testament. Jesus himself said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So what does baptism signify? 
signifies the washing away of sin by the blood of Christ, the renewal of lives by the Holy Spirit and union and communion with Jesus Christ. It was in the flood. There is no salvation outside of Noah's Ark. And so now there is no certain salvation outside of Jesus Christ. It is a sign of God's grace. We have a duty to respond to it. Isaac is not automatically regenerated or made a Christian at this point. No, we pray that in his life, that the Holy Spirit will be at work, that he would respond in faith, taking hold of God's promises to him. We're going to move to the uh, baptism now. I'm going to ask Rachel and the boys and Chris to come up to the front. Chris is going to ask Rachel and I and the family some questions, one to the congregation. So the questions to the parents, and then the question to, uh, to you, brothers and sisters, as the congregation. Matt and Rachel, please uh, give your answers to these questions, and after each question, please give your answer. Do you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to condemnation, they are holy in Christ by virtue of the covenant of grace, and as children of the covenant are to be baptised. We do. Do you promise to teach diligently to Isaac the principles of our holy Christian faith, revealed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, and summarised in the confession of faith and catechisms of this church? We do. Do you promise to pray regularly with and for Isaac and to set an example of piety and godliness before him? We do. Do you promise to endeavour by all the means that God has appointed to bring Isaac up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, encouraging him to appropriate for himself the blessings and fulfil the obligations of the covenant? Thank you for your answers to this question. And now, congregation, there's a question for us too. And the answer to this, uh, you'll see the question and the answer on the orders of service. And if you're uh, tuning in uh, on the live stream and you're a congregation member, please uh, speak out loud your uh, response to this question too at home. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you, congregation, receive Isaac into your midst? And do you promise to pray for him as the Lord enables you? What is your answer to this question? With God's help, we do. And now Matt will perform the baptism. Isaac. Philip thoughts, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Isaac, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you grace. May you never know a day. Without the Lord Jesus Christ being your Lord and your King. Perhaps you'd like, perhaps you'd like to sit down and uh, I'll, I'll pray. <laughs> Isaac did very well, didn't he? Let's pray. Our gracious and ever-loving and eternal God, who is Father 
and Son and Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for Isaac. We give you thanks to Lord for all of our children. We give you thanks that uh, he uh, has uh, come to the point of birth safely and securely. And we give you thanks, O Lord, that your love is towards him. We give you thanks to our Father that the sign and the seal of baptism could be administered to him. And we give you thanks, our Lord Jesus, for your great love for children that you demonstrated when you lived among us. And that great love is still yours towards all our children. Thank you, O Lord, that you called and that you called us to allow the children to come to you. And so, Father, we do commend Isaac to you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as he grows, that he will grow in strength physically, that he will grow in knowledge of this world that you have made, but also in knowledge of you too. We pray for Matt and for Rachel. We pray, Lord, that you will grant to them your gifts and your graces of this holy task of parenting that you have entrusted to them. And we pray that they may bring up Isaac in the love of God to know you, to serve you, and to be wholly yours. We pray also, O Lord, for William and for Joshua, and we commend all of our children to you, Lord. We pray that they may know for themselves the love of Christ, and that they may rejoice in you themselves always. And so we commit our prayers to you, praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, children, it's time for our, our children's talk. Anyone have any idea uh, what this is? Hannah? A squelched up piece of paper. Is that what you think, Josh? Yes. Yes? And, and what's the best thing you think you could do with a scrunched up bit of paper like this, which is, which is ripped? got writing all over it. Well, what's the best thing you can do with something like this? William? Put it in the bin. Any other ideas? Well, putting it in the bin is probably the best idea, isn't it? You know, we're like this. Like a scrunched up bit of paper. Not useful for much. That's what our lives are like full of sin and wrong things we do, not good for anything. But do you know what? God doesn't just throw us in the bin and cast us away. No, God takes this, what's rubbish, falling apart, not good for anything. God takes that. What's this? Hannah. Yes, that's right. And he makes it brand new and useful. Well, what kind of things could you do with this bit of paper, William? You could draw a picture on it, yes. Any other ideas, Hannah? You could stick things on it, that's right. And you know, God does something as well. When we become a Christian, we give given a brand new life. God doesn't just leave us like this. God does something amazing. Anyone know what this is? You get extra bonus points if you can tell me who the artist is. <laughs> Someone said Monet. Monet, that's right. God doesn't make you into money. No, that's... But what, what, what's that a picture of? William? It is a bridge, isn't it? Anything else you can see? Hannah? A lake. Yes, there is. Water underneath, isn't it, with beautiful flowers and scenery. You know, this is probably one of the most expensive pictures and paintings that's ever been sold in the world. I think it got 40 million pounds, something like this. This is not it, by the way. This is just a piece of paper. I'm not holding the most expensive painting of the world. I don't, I don't know where it is, actually, but this is not it. This is a print-off. So you could put that on your wall if you want, if you want to say you have a Monet on your wall. But God takes something that's rubbish, falling apart, 
makes it new, then doesn't stop there, goes to restore and recreate to make something absolutely beautiful, valuable and wonderful. That's what God does. He says, in Paul writes in Ephesians, that we are God's workmanship. That means we are God's work of art. That everything that happens in our lives, he is there recreating us to make us beautiful and stunning. That's what God's doing to us right now. If you are a Christian, that's what God's doing. He's recreating you, shaping you, painting you, decorating you, beautifying you. Why? Because he loves you. And because he is wonderful. Amen. Thank you for listening, children. We're going to see something more of that in our passage today in Jonah chapter 3. Now let's come to our time of prayer for ourselves and others now before we look at God's word together. Our gracious and almighty God, we thank you for your astounding love, your creative love and mercy, your grace. We thank you that you draw near to those who are struggling, those sheep of your flock who are wounded, who are lost, who are sick. We thank you like a, a, a good father looks after his children. So you are perfect, heavenly father. Remember our frame. Remember that we are dust. Know our weaknesses. Know when we sit down and stand up and know exactly how to help us. How to draw near to us, who to bring into our lives to bless us. Oh Father, we pray for those amongst us today that we know of, who are struggling. We thank you for those who have been ill, who have recovered, who have got better. We pray for those who are still undergoing difficult times at the moment, through lots of treatment and hospital appointments. We pray for those who are tired. We pray for those who are, who are struggling with lockdown still and longing for it to be over, to, to see people and see loved ones. We pray for those who are struggling at work who, or those who haven't got work who need it. Please help us in, in each particular case, in each way that we need perfectly for each of us. Father, forgive us for not trusting in you. Help us to look to you. To remember to bear one another's burdens and to pray for each other. Father, we pray for our government, especially at this time with the new Indian strain of, of coronavirus. Give them all wisdom that they need. The Prime Minister and his cabinet to know exactly when and, and if and how to lift further restrictions for lockdown. Help us to be patient. Our hearts may have sunk when we read the newspaper headlines or, or saw the news that the 21st of June could be delayed when things would get back to normal. But help us to know that you are sovereignly in control of all that happens and that you will give us all that you require of us. So help us to look to you. Help us to be patient. Yes, to long for that time but to know that it is in your perfect will when it will happen. Father, we pray for those countries, India and Brazil, where the virus is much worse than it is here, where vaccinations are fewer. Lord, please be at work there. Give them all that they need. Help, them to help those who are struggling. Bless those who are in hospital. Bless those families who have lost loved ones, that they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and that wonderful hope of eternal life in his name. Lord, and we give these things to you here and answer our prayers according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we come to look at God's word together in Jonah chapter 3, we're going to come to our second hymn, O oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary.
Before we come to God's word together in Jonah chapter 3, let us pray and ask for his help. Almighty God, we thank you that you speak, that your word is written, and your spirit is at work helping us to understand. Please help us now to see and hear wonderful things from your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been going through a series in the Old Testament book of Jonah. We've reached Jonah chapter 3. We've been thinking about the fact that the book of Jonah is not about Jonah. It is all about God. Chapter 2 was not about a fish. Chapter 1 was not about Jonah and the sailors. all about the astounding and amazing grace of God. And we're going to see that further now in Jonah chapter 3. As we think about the surprising grace of God. So let us... Hear the word of God from Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, Three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of God. In 2016, there was a heartwarming story that the West Yorkshire Police up in Huddersfield, received a phone call from a Sainsbury supermarket in Huddersfield. The person from the Sainsbury supermarket had said that an elderly lady had been shopping, had bought her shopping, had, had got her flowers, but was confused, suffering with dementia, was confused about what to do next. She had it all in her trolley, had the flowers in her hand. The Sainsbury staff, they let her take that shopping home for free. And PC Dave, which might be his real name or not, according to the newspaper, we'll call him PC Dave, he drove this lady home. While driving her home, he had his hand on her hand all the way to reassure her that everything's okay. And when they get to her house, PC Dave helped her to settle in. He put her shopping away in her cupboards and he put the flowers in a vase with some water and one of the little packets on the display in the window. And his comment was at the end of this, it's all in a day's work. And there's lots of stories like this, aren't there? Kind of stories of surprising kindness, amazing acts of kindness that we can read in the newspapers sometimes. All through last year in lockdown, I remember reading lots of different stories of how people were helping their neighbours during lockdown. And when we come to Jonah chapter 3, Jonah, which is all about God and his kindness, 
surprising kindness and his grace, his undeserved love and kindness to those who don't deserve it. Like he saved the sailors in Jonah chapter 1. He pursued and saved Jonah in an astonishing way by appointing and preparing a great fish to swallow him, to save him from drowning. We're going to see in chapter 3 the surprising grace of God to those who don't deserve it. The surprising kindness of God in two different ways. We're going to see one of them this week, part one, and Lord willing, next week we'll see the second part. This week we're going to see in the restoration, the restoration of Jonah from verses one to four. Next week we're going to see in the revival in Nineveh from verses five to ten, the surprising grace of God. And it's good for us to think about this. Because sometimes we can get the idea from reading the Old Testament or that common perception that the God of the Old Testament is a tyrant, that he's cruel, he's distant. But let our hearts be warm this morning as we spend time just briefly this morning looking at the surprising grace and kindness of God in the restoration of Jonah in Jonah 3 verses 1 to 4. And for God, like the West Yorkshire police, although on a much grander and more wonderful scale, it's all in a day's work. It's exactly what God is like. So let's look at the restoration of Jonah then and see the surprising grace of God. We're going to see it in four ways in verses 1 to 4. We see the fact of his restoration, the nature of his restoration, the means of of his restoration and the results of Jonah's restoration. So firstly then, the fact of Jonah's restoration. At the end of chapter 2, we read, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now before that, if you remember last week, we were with Jonah in the belly of the fish. She was there for three days and three nights. You read the rest of chapter 2, Jonah's prayer this, in this psalm. He's talking about how he went down to the depths. He went down to the, the crevices and the valleys of the earth, to the very bottom of the sea. He talks about how his life in verse 7 of chapter 2 was fainting away from him, was fading away. That he was close and moments from death, but how the Lord saved him. In Jonah 1, Jonah 2, verse 1, the Lord had appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah up, to save him, like a submarine swooping down to rescue him. So you see, God's saving grace and the fact that Jonah was restored from certain death to life. Now, in the beginning of chapter 3, we meet Jonah and he's back on the land again. In Jonah chapter 1, he was in a great storm. He was thrown into the sea. The sailors, they, I'm not sure if they ever met Jonah again, they thought he died. But now we meet Jonah miraculously and he's back on the land again. He restored, God restored Jonah to new life. Out of the, sto- the storm, out of the sea... Out of the fish to new life. There's a a TV program on the BBC at the moment called The Repair Shop, which takes clocks and benches and chairs and, and things that are falling apart. And they take them, and after hearing about all the interesting stories about them, they they repair them and they restore them to something useful again. But Jonah was in pieces. Jonah was beyond repair. No one could dive down there and save him. He was at death's door, completely helpless, without any hope. And yet the Lord scooped him up and brought him to new life, restoring him to use. This is what God's like. This is what God likes. He takes things, dead things, and makes them alive. You see that from creation, how God spoke and everything that is came into existence through the exodus 
God's people, the Israelites, were in slavery, no hope. They could never muster an army to rebel against Pharaoh and set themselves free. They were captive. But God came and rescued them and brought them through water, interestingly enough, to new life, to be a new nation. His people, I will be your God and you will be my people. Think of what Jesus did to Lazarus through Jesus himself. God shows his surprising grace that is not limited by death. See, the fact of Jonah's restoration is that he's there, standing on the beach, on dry land again, brought back from the dead to new life. And this is not the, just where the story ends for Jonah. This is the very beginning of God's working in his life. This is the beginning of his restoration. You see the fact of his restoration. And secondly, we see the nature of Jonah's restoration. What exactly is it like? Because the surprising grace of God doesn't stop with just saving Jonah from from certain death. It doesn't stop there. You see, in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Remember what happened when God said that to Jonah the first time. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah went and ran away the opposite direction, down to the coast of Joppa, to then get a ship to Tarshish, which is the furthest direction away in Spain. But here, God doesn't say, okay, I've saved you from drowning, I'm now going to bring you up, but that's it. You're, you're, you carry on your life, you go your way, and I'll go my way. Sometimes, Relationships can end up like that, can't they? When there's been hurt and pain, when there's now forgiveness, sometimes it's, okay, things are amicable. Things, we, there, there's no kind of enmity between us anymore. I don't hate you, you don't hate me, but you go your way and I'll go my way. That's not what God does, is it? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God is not finished. His grace continues. He's not just only restoring Jonah to life, but he's restoring of him of his his previous honor and favor as a prophet of the Lord. See, the beginning of chapter 3 is almost word for word the same as the beginning of chapter 1. Chapter 1 starts, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Chapter 3 starts almost exactly the same way. You can understand, couldn't you? If God didn't want to use Jonah, they say, I'll find someone else who's going to go to Nineveh. Someone more reliable. I don't know if I can trust you. I've got your past record. Just here, your CV is in front of me. I know what you're like. You did this and this before, so that affects what kind of position I give you this time. No, God has forgiven Jonah. God's rescued him. He's completely forgiven Jonah. His sin has been removed from him as far as the east is from the West. God doesn't bring up his past record. Says, now Jonah, listen here. You're not going to run away again, are you? You're not going to get to the gate of Nineveh and then turn around again, are you? Can I trust you this time? God doesn't say that at all. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise and go to Nineveh. You know, there's a, a type of journalist called a muckraker. A muckraker who's someone who likes to, to rake up the past corruption of politicians or celebrities to then put it in the newspapers so that those people in those prominent positions in our society cannot escape from something they did 20 or 30 years ago while at university or at school. And you see it, during, especially during election times, You see, journalists from newspapers who support the other party like to bring things up about their potential leaders or candidates 
So then they have to answer to those questions. They're bringing up past failures. You see it all around us, their their past, their past mistakes and decisions and words even. Things they wrote on Twitter or on Facebook kind of follow behind them like a bad smell. That's not what it's like with God. That's not what it's like with God at all. God doesn't bring it up. There's no mention of it here. God isn't hesitant to use Jonah again. To use him as his ambassador, as his special envoy to Nineveh. He quickly recommissions Jonah for the task that he originally gave him in 1 verse 1. To take this message, message of of judgment, but with hope of, with message of compassion and of grace. A warning from the King of Kings and the Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. You know, sometimes, if we're Christians, we can think that our past will come back to haunt us. The decisions we've made, the things we've done, the actions that we wish would go away. We can think they hang around our neck like an ID tag. With God, there is complete forgiveness. Total removal of any stain. You've seen the the Daz or Fairy Liquid washing powder adverts. There's not a stain on that bright white shirt. In God's sight, that's what you're like. Not a stain, not even a single wrinkle or crease. Because you've been cleansed by the powerful and permanent solvent of the blood of Jesus. Things are not just swept under the rug. They're nailed to the cross, destroyed with the Lord, with Christ. You have a completely fresh start. God forgets and never holds things against you. Never remembers things in order to wave them in your face later like God could have done with Jonah. God never holds grudges or reluctantly forgives. Now people find it hard to forgive. Hard to forgive where there's been lots of pain. God doesn't. Yes, our forgiveness came at a cost. But that cost has been paid. So are you running from God? Stop and turn to him. Receive that warm welcome. Receive a cloak of righteousness. Have your dirty, filthy rags of sin taken away, burned in the rubbish heap, never to be seen again. Receive a warm welcome, complete forgiveness and a fresh start. You see the nature of Jonah's restoration? It is total restoration. It is complete forgiveness. You've seen the fact of Jonah's restoration. You've seen the nature of his restoration. Thirdly, we see the means of Jonah's restoration. How is God restoring him? How is he restoring him? Like we saw in the children's talk, he doesn't just leave us as a blank slate, that bright white piece of paper, but God is at work like an artist or a builder. But what does he do? What tools does he use? Well, the the means of his restoration we see there in verse 1 is the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. It's the word that picks him up and dusts him off. It's the word that bestows favour upon him, grace and mercy upon him, restoring him to his old office as a prophet and servant of the Lord is through the word of the Lord. There's a song that our children like, And part of it is all about the word of the Lord. And it says, like a a light and a hammer and a fire and a sword. Like a light and a hammer and a fire and a sword. This is the Bible. The word of God is the the tool case, the toolbox that God uses to restore us. 
to create something beautiful in us, to beautify his church and his people. The means of Jonah's restoration and our restoration and our recreation is the word of God. By coming, by reading it, by sitting under the preaching of the word, singing the word, memorizing it, being taught, learning. It's through the word that the spirit recreates us, restores us. Like a baby Isaac, we baptized. He's transformed by food. He's transformed from a little baby, from a newborn, to a little baby like he is now, then to a toddler, then to a little boy, then to a teenager, then to an adult. But how is he transformed? By food. By food, by giving him, at the moment he's on, leek and carrots and potatoes and Brussels sprouts, all those delicious things. Soon he'll be on meat and, and other things and chocolate. But it's by food that he's transformed. And it's through the food of the written word of God that we are transformed and restored and recreated. It's the means of God's restoration of Jonah is the word of God. This Bible we have here is a wonderful gift of God's grace. He doesn't want it to make make it difficult for us to learn and to know who he is, to know who Jesus is, to learn what's wrong and what's right, to learn how to walk in a wise way or in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. He's put it right here in front of us. And by his grace over the centuries, it's been translated into a language we can understand. So we can hear it read and we can understand it. That by the Spirit working through the word, we are restored. We are transformed and recreated and made beautiful. So you see, in the surprising grace of God in the restoration of Jonah, we've seen it in the, the fact of Jonah's restoration, the nature of his restoration, the, the means of his restoration, and fourth and finally, we see it in the results of his restoration. The results of his restoration, you see that in verse 2 and 3. Arise, go to Nineveh, God said, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. In verse 3, what did Jonah do? So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days in journey and breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. You see, the results of God's working in Jonah's life, of bringing him from death to life, of restoring him by his word, what's the results of this? You see, a complete change in Jonah. Do you remember the Jonah back in in chapter 1? How did Jonah react in verse 3? But Jonah rose to flee, to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, rebelling against the Lord's commands, against his favor saying no I want, don't want to do this I want to go this way you see the complete change we see in Jonah now in chapter 3 so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh he obeyed see Jonah having personally experienced the astonishing and surprising grace of God his heart has been won without hesitating Showing faith and trust in the Lord. Showing courage and boldness. He heads to the vast city of Nineveh. You see the description there. In the comment. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth. That's a way of saying it was probably about 48 miles in diameter. 48 miles all the way round. It was a huge city. The end of chapter 4, we read that it was 120,000 persons. That could have just been 120,000 men, not including women and children and, as well. So it was a vast city. That's about the same size of Cheltenham, 120,000. 
But you imagine this is thousands of years ago. This was a a colossus of a city. And what does Jonah do? It says, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. That means on the first day he was in the city. On the first day he was in the city, he called out the message that the Lord had given him. Jonah didn't try and make excuses. Oh, I'll just go and check into a hotel first. Or I'll just go and make sure everything's fine. I'll go and arrange for the, the sound system to be all set up. No, his first moment he's there, he calls out the message he's been given. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't waste any time. As soon as he gets there, he proclaims the message that God gave him. See, Jonah couldn't help but humble himself and obediently serve God. Can you imagine the risk that was involved? Nineveh was an enemy of the northern kingdom of Israel at this time. And Jonah going in there as an ambassador, as a representative of the Lord with a message. You can read the message there. It's not a message of, of God loves you. God gives you peace. No, it says Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There's in the risk. And yet Jonah was willing to go to that risk, was willing to take that risk through all the perils that that he might face, all the dangers, toils, and snares. Why? Because he loved God. He tasted, he'd experienced personally. Of all places, at the bottom of the sea, in the belly of a great fish, the astonishing grace of God and his life has been changed. The God who who rescued him, who didn't give him what he deserved, but raised him up, restored favour and love and grace to him, has shown him such patience and kindness. Now, there's lots of amazing missionary biographies that we could read. And they tell a wonderful story similar to this, that people hundreds of years ago going the other side of the world, going thinking we're probably not going to come back, leaving family and friends like William Carey going to India, Hudson Taylor going to China, Jim Elliot just 50 or 60 years ago going to a tribe that were known to be dangerous in South America, going and risking their lives. Why? Because as Paul writes, and Paul did the same. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ compels us. For the love of Christ compels us. We love the Lord so much, we do anything to please him, to serve him. Aren't we familiar with this kind of risk-taking love in our media, aren't we? In films and dramas, we see people willing to forfeit career or to leave jobs to care for a, a sick wife, and it makes a lovely drama and a good story. Or a friend willing to get up at three o'clock in the morning to take someone to the airport, when we're not the same kind of scale, to risk it all for love. We're used to this kind of idea. But this is the real thing. It's the results of Jonah's restoration is this complete change in heart and direction. Before he was willing to say no to the Lord and go the opposite direction, now he says, I will go. I will go. But what brought this change on? But it was the creative love, the creative love of God at work in Jonah. See, naturally, like Jonah in chapter 1, that's what we're all like. And God breaks down Jonah in order to recreate in him something lovely, something wonderful. It's like when you decorate a room, you don't just go and paint over the old wallpaper. You have to first strip it all back, get right back to the bare wall. And then maybe you need to do some more plastering. And then you can start having a fresh coat of paint and create a beautiful room. You don't just put new carpet on top of old carpet or a new sofa next to an old sofa. You have to strip back all the old stuff. 
in order to bring in the new, to recreate. This is God's creative love at work in Jonah. It's what the 16th century reformer Martin Luther says. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. God didn't look at Jonah and say, you're lovely. He says, I will make you lovely. I will make you wonderful. God takes the unlovely, the broken, the repulsive, the sinful, and creates something wonderful, recreating Jonah in his image. Remember Genesis chapter 1, God made man in his image. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So here, when we look at Jonah, we see something of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came obediently. Obedience was a a big mark on Jesus' life. Jesus was sent. He went willingly. He loved his Father and was willing to do his Father's work, to risk his life, to give his life. You see here a pale reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think, well, what are we being recreated and changed into? We're being recreated, restored from one degree of glory to another to be more and more like Jesus in how we think, in what motivates us, in our actions, in our decisions. If you're a Christian, then this creative love is at work in you. You are God's workmanship, his work of art created for good works in Christ, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2. You know, there's a a radio host in America called Ted Williams, and he Ten or so years ago, was homeless in Columbus, in Ohio, in the States. He was a recovering alcoholic. He was on the streets. He was, and a news crew were just passing by. And they made an astonishing discovery of his voice. They nicknamed it the Golden Voice. And then after that, he was offered radio jobs. He's now working full time and getting a book deal coming out, doing the adverts for the Super Bowl. It's been complete restoration of this man who is at the very bottom. But with Jonah, God didn't see some kind of gift that he had. Jonah wasn't just on the streets, he was at the bottom of the sea. With weeds wrapped around his head, life fading away, nothing desirable about him, nothing to say, I can use that. All of God's grace, God's undeserving riches and love and kindness lavished on those who have done everything not to deserve it. See, the results of this restoration is this creative love, is this change of heart and love for the Lord that the Lord has brought about. You see, for God here in Jonah's restoration, it's not surprising. It's all in a day's work. This is exactly what God is like. He takes people like you and me, undeserving, rebellious, sinners, deserving of judgment. And through death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he picks us up from death to life and gets to work restoring and recreating us into the image of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is lovely and pleasing to him. Is that Jesus' baptism? The, 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 a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Well, if you are in Christ, if he is yours and you are his, then he can point at you and say, You are mine, and with you I am well pleased. This is God's business. This is what he's like. He's in the business of total restoration from death to life. We've seen through Jonah the surprising grace of God in his restoration, in the fact of his restoration. He is now alive and on the beach. 
See, the nature of his restoration, total and complete forgiveness. See, the means of his restoration through his word and the results of his restoration, a complete change and being recreated into his son with a love and a desire to serve the Lord. Is this your view of God? You still think of him as a, as a tyrant, someone distant? This is the surprising grace of God, although the further we read and look at the God of the Bible, it's not so surprising, because we see it over and over and over again. If we don't see this, then pray. Read further. And pray like Jonah, you will personally taste and experience the surprising and the restoring grace of God, which is freely available to all who would come to him. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the riches of the treasury of your word that we have in front of us. We thank you that your grace has been lavished upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we who were dead in trespasses and sins have been made alive. Let us delight in you, to serve you and honour you, to give thanks to you. Please help us, in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to our third and final hymn together this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Let us stand for our benediction. 
Brothers and sisters, may the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.